Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, I hope you, you're, gonna, you're doing well, and, uh, and I realize that uh, we are, we're having a very difficult time from a national political standpoint. But here in Oregon, I think we have a little sense, if you will, in terms of how we are doing things. Well, this 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 day's uh, this particular show we're going to be doing today will be something on an issue that we should all be um, looking at, and I'm talking about the CRC or the Columbia Columbia River Corridor or Columbia River Bridge, as you might know from a layman's standpoint. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about bridges. We've we've done shows here about the bridge. We've talked about uh, the monies that have been spent, et cetera. And, uh, and now here we are today talking about whether or not, in fact, we're going to be able to build this particular bridge. And there's, there's all sorts of issues involved in it. But anyway, but just jump, jumping right into this, in the Oregonian there was a featured, featured article talking about the need for I-5 bridge should be issued in mayor's race. So I thought it would be an, it, it'd be an opportunity for us to, to introduce you to someone that's going to be running for, that's going to, has got his hat, in, is, is, he, he's running for mayor, if you will. I'm talking about one of Joe's son, Joe, Joe Smith. You know Joe. Remember the legislature, Joe? Well, Joe's been around for quite some time, but now his son has been very much involved. Remember the bus project and things of that nature have gotten a lot of young folks involved in the political side of this all. And, all. and I, it's, really, it's really exciting to, to see him involved in this particular race and, uh, and I, I liking the idea of giving that pathon over. And I'm sure Joe's feeling the same way that I am. And it's, it's nice to have this thing. But anyway, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the whole issue of the bridge situation. Uh, it, is, it was indicated in a couple other articles that uh, uh, because, um, because Jefferson Smith, uh, who represents District 47, is in the legislature, he happens to be running for mayor, he will be the only one that will probably be able to vote, if you will, on this particular issue. So I thought it would be an ideal time to basically give him an opportunity not only to talk about himself, and his representation uh, of 47, but also a little bit about the bridge and his position on the bridge, okay? And then after we do this, we're gonna probably talk about two alternatives uh, who are both with me. You've seen them before. I'm talking about Sharon Nash and also Ron Buell, and we'll be, we'll be able to talk with them about that. But hey, Jeff, welcome to work. Good to be here, man. Thanks right, for having me. Appreciate right, it. Enough, really. Yeah, big fan. You know, buy all the books, buy all the movies. It's been great. <laughs> oh, good. YouTube videos. <laughs> oh boy, I, I like it already. iTunes. Right. You're all, you're up there. Well, Joe, Joe's, Joe's feeling good now. You know, I am, I am too. Both. Trust me. Yeah, we're, we're both feeling good. Well, good. <laughs> me too. Well, tell me about. It. Let's talk a little bit about yourself. Sure. Now let's talk about the fact how you got involved. In the, first, of the bus project from, from yeah. Home. So the, the briefest of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I uh, was born here. Went to grad high school. Okay. Uh, University of Oregon, went out east to law school, uh, finished at Harvard, uh, came back here and started a nonprofit organization. Did that for several years, uh, got it to a place where we had uh, four uh, headquarters in four different states with affiliates and got to a place where it felt like it could stand on its own legs and continue to grow without me. And in 2008, I ran for the state house and became state representative for, as you said, District 47, right. which is Jeff Merkley's old house seat. Right have served in the legislature since then and working on issues like putting the uh, Oregon budget online so that every citizen can see how we're spending people's money, uh, working on water policy to try to get an aquifer recharge a project for Eastern Oregon and finally get Oregon integrated water strategy, which we would, shouldn't, which we haven't, excuse me, which we haven't had in a long time. One of the few states that hasn't had one. Uh, the cool schools plan to retrofit public schools for energy efficiency. Uh, the uh, stage two economic development plan, the economic gardening plan to help 100 homegrown Oregon businesses find new customers and find new markets, uh, online voter registration, the first human trafficking bill, I think, uh, in our state's history. So those are some of the things I've been working on recently. And now I'm running for mayor, oh, that's trying fantastic. not to stutter my way through this interview. Let, 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 share a little bit about that bus project. Why did you get involved in that piece? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of people in my generation uh, and in my age group were getting disconnected from the political process. Mm -hmm. We had parents who were pretty darn involved in the 60s and 70s, and a lot of the children of the 80s and 90s were not as engaged in the civic process. And we were seeing the results of that in our government and how money was being spent, how money was being raised, the decisions that were being made, including on transportation, like right. we're going to talk about in a moment, and realizing there was a little group of us that were recognizing, you know what, we can't just uh, allow democracy to be a spectator sport. We can't just observe what's happening to us, we've got to actually do stuff. And so we started getting 
uh, young people involved uh, working on state legislative races and then starting a nonpartisan uh, organization to register and turn out uh, young voters, registered over 70,000 voters, helped pass online voter registration, mm -hmm. which 85,000 Oregonians have uh, registered to vote online since we passed that, a little better than that. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about the bus. And then we helped start, uh, helped other states starting to do uh, similar things. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it's had, the, hopefully it will continue to have the kind of impact that we hope it'll have. Okay. The mayor's race. Why, why, why the mayor's race? Why, why, why run for mayor? Yeah. Uh, uh, briefly. The, yeah, I'm going to have you on more. more yeah. The shortest of answers is that this seems like the most important thing. And by that, I mean making sure the city of Portland becomes the city it ought to be, becomes the city it aspires to be. It's the most important thing I think any of us can put our energies into. This is a wonderful city. It right? gave me tremendous opportunities, gave like, you pretty darn good yes, opportunities. Yes. And I want to make sure that those opportunities are available to the next generation. I also want to make sure it's a city that works for everybody, because I think there's a sense right now that it's not working for everybody. It's not working for everybody who lives in North Northeast Portland. It's not working for everybody who lives out in East Portland. It's not working for every business person who's trying to get a business started. It's not working for everybody. And I think if we put a commitment in to making it work for more people, uh, that could be really valuable and could be a really valuable expenditure of energy. That seems good. Uh, and then also to uh, make sure we seize and continue kind of a progressive vision for our economy and that we demonstrate a commitment to good government. Our city and our state has been corruption-free more than almost any major city in the country. We have had a really strong and benevolent public interest focus in how we run our government, and that's something we just can't lose and we got to build on. Okay, fine. Well, this is great. Well, you know, we're going to have you, probably have you on in, in, in the future, if you will. Woohoo! But the bottom line is that here, you're in the mayor's race, yes. and it's been said that um, they feel, felt that the, the candidates should be involved in this whole issue with the Columbia River Crossing, if you yeah. will, the bridge project. Yeah. And it, and it was noted also, too, that you would probably be the only one of the three yeah. people, the three major people yeah. that are running, that will be able to comment and vote on this particular issue. What, what, what's the deal? What's, what's your issue? What's your feel about this? Yeah. So first I'll say the things that I think I know. Okay. There's a lot we don't know, which is right. part of my concern, but let me tell you the things that I think I know. As far as I can tell, there are four major income streams, at least, that I see significant questions about. $450 million from Oregon, $450 million from Washington State, uh, you know, $1 to $2 billion from the feds, and then money from tolling. Okay. I don't know where we're going to get 36 votes in the House and 18 votes in the Senate to pass a new gas tax in Oregon anytime soon, nor do I see the $450 million of existing projects that we're going to set aside. It's not clear to me that Washington is going to approve their $450 million. They got two huge projects in the queue before this one. Third, I'm not sure the Tea Party Congress is that excited about giving us $1 to $2 billion here in Oregon. And fourth, our own treasurer, Ted Wheeler, says the tolling math we've done doesn't add up. So I see significant uh, questions about the current project. Uh, people I think you know, uh, you know, Lou Frederick and Ben Cannon wrote an op-ed uh, saying this was an environmental injustice, that this was going to allow for uh, commuting for Vancouver commuters, most of, the, most of the travel by local commuters. The people who are going to pay the freight in terms of asthma, et cetera, were going to be inner north and northeast Portland residents. Uh, two Republican accountants, the two accountants in the state legislature, uh, wrote an op-ed saying, I don't see how the math adds up. So I've had significant questions. The one way I have engaged is that there was a, a rubber stamp bill, a resolution, just to say, yeah, sounds good. Let's pass it. Let's move forward on the project. And I did oppose that. I did think that was the wrong thing to do at the time. Just say, hey, let's do it. Whatever it is, let's do it. I didn't think that was right. Uh, at this point, I do think that we need to address the seismic issues. Let's be clear, though, there are 25 bridges in the interstate system that are structurally unsound, according to ODOT, and this bridge isn't currently listed as one of them. That said, we need to make sure, if there is a big Japan-style earthquake, that we have a safe and sturdy bridge between here in Vancouver and north. Second, we've got to prioritize freight mobility. I think that's important, not just from Portland to Vancouver, but from Ashland to Seattle and north. That's really important. But it's not clear to me that we got to spend $2 billion on local interchanges. It's not clear to me that this has got to be something that costs, if you include interest, as much as $10 billion. I'm not sure about those things. Okay. I'm not sure if the legislature is actually going to vote on anything yeah. this okay. short session. Okay. It's been said that we might. Okay. Uh, we'll see. So I guess it's verifiable. It, it will be an issue in the mayoral race, right? We'll there see. I, but I guess by definition of it being written about in the right. paper and you exactly. asking about it, I suppose yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah, I will say this, and we don't all agree on it, right. right? We have at least one candidate who's just said, oh, let's just get on with it. Let's just build the thing. And and I'm not prepared to do that yet. As, as strongly as I believe that we do need to address seismic issues and freight mobility, the uh, what I am, uh, what I also want us to be a little humble about, though, is that it's not clear what the next mayor's role will be. Mm -hmm. If I'm wrong, if the money's all there and it all works out, 
it might not who's mayor next might not matter that much right you know right now the city council the current city council has already voted in favor of this plan and the governor and the legislature and the feds sort of have control at this point uh, so if i'm wrong it might not matter that much but if i'm right we're going to need to be serious about a plan B. And I think a plan B ought to relook at some of our assumptions in terms of, are we sure we need to tear down this bridge, which costs $180 million to do? Or should we consider retrofitting it, which costs $200 million, just about the same, and consider building another bridge, either for rail or for commuters uh, uh, or for freight or for some combination? So I think, and, and I don't count myself an engineer or an expert, uh, but what I've seen right now is a dynamic whereby most politicians don't want to talk about this issue very much at all, right? Because most of the power that involves itself in political campaigns, whether it's from the right or the left, most of the power is in favor of this project, right? I mean, there's been $160 million spent, and we haven't laid a brick, right? So there's a lot of power, and, and I would rather not talk about it either on this program or anywhere else, but I think we've got to be willing to talk about it. It's one of the biggest things that our state is facing. I don't know if I'll be able to do anything about it as mayor, but we at least have to come to grips with it. Well, Reverend Smith, we, we appreciate the, uh, your introduction to this piece because, in all due respect, it is an issue. Yeah. The alternative plans out there that, in all due respect, wasn't given fair hearing on this particular issue. And so we're going to probably continue to discuss this issue. But I want to thank you very much for giving us that introduction. Happy to do it. A couple it. of folks that are going to be here to talk about that. And, and I hope to see you very soon again. Happy okay. day, man. All right, I'll I'll right. some food. Dad, see you. All, all right. right. Cheers. All right. There he goes. He's on the road, folks. There he goes. He's out, he's out in the running. He's knocking on those doors. That's what it's all about. Okay, good. Well, there you go. No problem. All right. What we're going to do, we're going to take a short break. In fact, uh, we'll take a short break and get the other two people on, and then we'll talk about some alternative plans, alternative bridge, okay? Yeah, okay. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks. As you can see, uh, Representative Smith, uh, uh, i.e. running for mayor, uh, I mean, th this issue about the crossing, if you will, of the Columbia is an issue. And we've spent a lot of money talking about the crossing. But the bottom line, we've not seen a bridge. <laughs> we don't even have a plan. We've got rendering. We've had renderings over the last years, if you will, we've been spending, I don't know how many years we've been doing this stuff. But anyway, but we, but what we're going to do now is that uh, we've got two individuals here who have been spending some time, if you will, I mean, some valuable time in terms of what, just how, what what should we do on this whole issue, this transportation issue, okay? And, um, and in fact, what they've got, they've got alternative alternatives, plans, if you will, of, uh, of, of a bridge, uh, of the crossing, talking to the crossing. And I'm talking about both, you've seen these folks before, I'm talking about Ron Buell, uh, to my uh, to my left, uh, to my right, but to the left on the screen, you, you see Ron. You know Ron, and uh, he's got uh, Ron's got the um, uh, the common sense uh, alternative. That's 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 the concept that he has, and we're going to talk a little bit about that one. And then you've seen seen Sharon. You know Sharon. She's got the the third bridge, the third bridge, and she's been on the show before. But it's getting to be critical right now, and so we need to really get into the discussion. So that's what we're going to do. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to have two segments here. We're going to have, uh, Ron's going to talk about his particular program, his plan, and then Sharon's going to talk about hers, the second half. And then what we're going to do, then we're going to uh, just have a discussion. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Ron, we'll, get, we'll start with yours. I'm going to give a little intro, intro about you, please. 
Well, yes, the common sense alternative developed by George Crandall and uh, Jim Howell okay. is uh, just one of several alternatives that uh, should be considered. If we had some leadership from the governor, from the state legislature on this issue, we would have uh, a pause because we don't have any money for to to build the Columbia River Crossing project. Mm -hmm. you know, if it were just a bridge project, and they were just spending four hundred million dollars for a new bridge, mm -hmm. then Sharon and I might not be so opposed right. to it. Right. But it's a three point six billion dollar project with uh, over half of that being spent on six different interchanges, and. Light rail. Some of us are in favor of light rail, and and it would be included. I mean, they've been trying to find money for this thing for three years now, since the middle of 2008. And hired Richard Brandman at for two of those years at $160,000 a year to go looking for money from the feds, and they don't have any money yet. And the plan they have for tolling, uh, why the state treasurer Ted Wheeler told the governor that. Hey, there's a big hole in the middle of that, a $500 million hole in that, uh, you know. And so uh, we think it's time for a pause. Yeah. And the state legislature is looking at this right now. They have an interim committee, um, and there's 10 members of that. Is and, Smith, Reverend Smith on that, Smith on that, on that committee? Yeah. Uh, no, he's not. He's not on that committee. Uh, uh, Katie Brewer, Katie Iyer Brewer oh, okay. uh, is, is on it, and uh, Cliff Bentz and... Uh, and uh, Lee Beyer and uh, Tobias Reed are chairing it. Okay. And there's uh, seven other uh, senators and representatives. And you know, Sharon has talked to uh, almost every member of the House and a number of the senators. And we know that the legislature is not ready to spend $450 million out of the, and raise the gas tax by 12 cents a gallon. So why are we still going through this exercise? Because What's the problem? Th there are powerful uh, special interests that are trying to jam this thing through. Hmm. And I'm talking about the uh, construction union, uh, the building trades, and I'm talking about Portland Business Alliance, and I'm talking about the Port of Portland. Hmm. And these folks have all been pushing this from the first. It's been a big sales job. And one of the things that um, Sharon and I have been following this all the way through City Hall, all the way through Metro, uh, in the, and when they voted yes on the locally preferred alternatives, there were dissenters at both City Council and at Metro, uh, Carl Hostica and Robert Li Liberty at Metro, and Amanda Fritz at uh, the City of Portland. Uh, and though, I mean, all the way through, w we keep saying, Geez, if they just stick to the truth, if they just stick mm -hmm. to the facts, uh, it it would be a lot less uh, frustrating. Mm -hmm. If they really had looked at the alternatives, it would be a lot less frustrating. But they didn't really they did. look at all. And, that, and that's the concern. That's the reason why we're doing what we're doing mm -hmm. right now. Exactly. There was no serious look, if you will, at, at alternatives. And, and you're exactly right, and, and and so that's why we want to show you okay, uh, our our uh, two alternatives. Right, right. Now, I think Sharon's alternative is good, and she's not deathly opposed to my alternatives. I mean, we can nitpick them, but the point is that they weren't really even considered. Well, that's, that's and uh, and Metro asked for them to be considered, and they still didn't do it. And and so uh, you know. I think it's time uh, to take a pause, to have a reset, mm -hmm. to say, gee, let's do something that we can actually build, that will actually create some jobs now, that we can actually finance, that will actually create some jobs now. And, and that's what these two alternatives are. They can both be phased, they can both be started now, and we'd have jobs now. Instead of having spent $160 million, and we still don't have any commitments for financing the construction. Well, why don't we, in fact, at that particular note, why don't we just go, I understand you got a small, you got a video here, about seven minute video. Yeah, that'll show our alternative. Why don't we look at your common sense alternative. That'd be then, great. Then we'll get, we'll get Sharon, you, then you'll do a little introduction piece, and we'll talk about your piece, okay? That sounds do we wonderful. Have, do we have that it already It is on ready? a roll. <laughs> are, we, are we ready to go on that? We're going to have a discussion after this anyway, but uh, are we ready to go? Okay, here's a, here's a, here's a video of, the, of Ron's video of common sense alternative. Okay, let's go. 
Interstate 5 near the Columbia River has a problem with congestion, especially during the morning and evening commutes. The Columbia River Crossing proposes to solve this problem with a new bridge and several miles of freeway expansion. The Common Sense Alternative to the CRC by George Crandall and Jim Howell offers a cheaper, faster, and better way of crossing the Columbia River. The CSA would address all the issues and the CRC's purpose and needs, but with a more practical approach that puts more emphasis on crossing the river and less on freeway expansion. The CSA has five phases. The first phase of the Common Sense Alternative would eliminate the need for 95% of the lifts on the I-5 Interstate Bridge. It would do this by fixing the downstream rail bridge. Currently, in order to pass under both the high point of the I-5 bridge and the swing span of the rail bridge, river vessels have to perform a maneuver called the S-curve. If the S-curve is too difficult to perform in the fast-moving current, vessels use the drawbridge on I-5 instead. A fixed add a center lift span to the rail bridge would allow river traffic to pass under the high point of the I-5 bridge without having to perform the S-curve. This fix would also upgrade this, the only rail bridge for miles, which also happens to be one of the oldest bridges in the area. The second phase of the CSA would construct a multimodal bridge to Hayden Island for light rail, motor vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians. It would connect to Expo Road in a configuration similar to that of the CRC's Concept D. The third phase would be a new bridge for commuter trains, frequent fast inner-city trains, cars and trucks, and bicycles and pedestrians. By taking passenger trains off the existing rail bridge, the new bridge would provide more track capacity for freight trains. This bridge would connect Marine Drive and Mill Plain Boulevard, allowing trucks to bypass I-5. It would allow rail commuters to travel between Vancouver Station and Union Station in Portland in 10 to 12 minutes. And it would be located far enough downstream from Pearson Field that it could have a tall, elegant, two-tower cable stay design without interfering with air traffic. The cost of this new rail bridge would include a viaduct over the North Portland Freight Junction, a bridge over the harbor, a crossing over Hayden Island, the cable stay bridge itself, and a new passenger platform for Vancouver Station. Phase 4 would upgrade the I-5 interstate bridges to current seismic standards. Standards which, in the entire Portland region, are currently only met by the new Savi Island Bridge. Phase 5 would construct a multimodal bridge between Hayden Island and Vancouver for transit, local auto traffic, bicycles, and pedestrians. This bridge could be built using an economical, pre-stressed, box girder style of construction. The CSA could be built with a phased approach that would allow its effects to be evaluated in stages. 
It could provide the rail facilities that will be vital to the region's future. And it could offer resilience in the form of more ways across the river. And where the CRC would cost $3.6 billion for a solution that's more freeway than bridge, the CSA could offer comparable capacity for far less money. The Common Sense Alternative. Cheaper, faster, and better. Yeah, get it all, get it all in. Okay, folks, you've seen the common sense concern. That's Ron's view piece there. And uh, the thing that I was very interested in it was the cost factor. I mean, we, we lo we're looking at a recession, if you will, and money's a tight. And here we're talking about uh, $1.8 billion as opposed to $3.6 billion. But anyway, that, that's the common sense alternative, and that's Ron's presentation piece. And uh, I might add also, too, that uh, uh, for those of you who have Comcast and you, you're actually looking at the show here, uh, that's one thing. But then there are other folks, you know, for instance, there are senior citizens out there that can't afford, if you will, cable and, and the like and whatever. And uh, you can go to YouTube. Uh, so if you've got friends that would like to, i.e., see this presentation and whatever, uh, you might want to direct them to YouTube, and we are on YouTube now. It's uh, and the way you get there is just very simple. It's just a uh, YouTube www.youtube.com www.youtube.com forward slash forward slash the number thirty eight Broussard, the number thirty eight Broussard. And that's B R O U S S A R D. I think they've got it on screen right now. So if you want to share this with friends. Or whatever and get a better feel and then you can look at it over and over and over you can get gatherings and the like and you can just really get into it to get a better feel so you can start calling these folks who are going to be running for office to get that position on this piece okay so anyway that's i thought i'd give that information okay that was steve's i'm, I'm sorry i keep thinking about steve steve's his brother you know steve's on our education piece he does our education piece well, and, <laughs> and we want to say hi it. steve yeah, hi Steve. How hi Steve. Are say, everybody say hi to Steve. He, okay, he's, hi Steve. He, he's recuperating, you know, and he's looking to come back and see Miss Norman's kitchen. Anyway, <laughs> so now what we're going to do is that we got another plan, and mm -hmm. we got Sharon. Sharon's got got her plan, and and hers is the third bridge, the third bridge. And you've seen Sharon. I mean, if if you've been involved with CRC and talking about bridge and this and as and as Ron had said, she's visited everybody. She's gone all over the place to try to get them this to 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 look at another alternative. But unfortunately, it hasn't been presented. And that's one of the reasons why we're spending so much time uh, to do this for her, because in all due respect, we need this look at those alternatives. I mean, the, 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 well, my point is that with the dollars and the unemployment, we have no, uh, we're having some real serious problems right now. So we want to thank you, both, in fact, both of you, but thank you very much, Sharon, for, well, thank for sticking, you. sticking with this situation, both of you too, Ron. Okay. Hey, it's good to be here, and you've yeah. actually been a, a, a very good uh, person to put the show on several times, having to do with the yes. Columbia River Crossing. Yes. Over the last five or six years, you've had quite a bit of information on it, and you've asked quite a few of the people running for office. So that's always been very good. And we're going to continue to do that on public television. <laughs> hey, this is the that's, people. This is the people's channel, too. right? Okay. Yes, it is. So, Sharon, what about the third bridge? Well, um, well, first I'll tell you today. I, I had bought a PowerPoint, and it's turned out technical. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, okay. so we're going to show a map, and it's a okay. cartoon map. And actually, our website is thirdbridgenow.com. And um, on Third Bridge now, you'll find some other information and things. But um, ours is that... Uh, Let's put the map we, on screen and that way you can talk at the same time. That would be time. great. Put, put the map on screen if you map can. Just put the map on screen and then we'll just go from there. That yeah. would be good. Keep talking. Um, <clears throat> what we know is from previous studies is that we have fewer bridges than similar size cities. Okay. And that even if we had no congestion, no, I shouldn't say congestion, but commuters that came from Vancouver, we would still have congestion on I-5 and I-84. Okay, and we have been studying this since uh, since the late '80s when they said that the I-5 freeway itself had been deemed as overcapacity and failed. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things about the on and off ramps, and which is really good, that uh, is on screen now. Right? You can just talk to it at oh, the same good. time. Oh, good. 
uh, one of the things about uh, when Jefferson Smith talked about he wasn't convinced about you know the seismic there's other mm -hmm. bridges that have problems or the on and off ramps all the on and off ramps on, on the I-5 freeway from the freeway up to 78th are new hmm. and have been new since the 80s and it was 90 million dollars for the new Marine Drive one and they had already said that the slew bridge between or excuse me the the harbor bridge between Jansen Beach and the main island doesn't need to be replaced. You know, so they're talking about phasing that. So the, the, the idea that we're going to take a piece of infrastructure, which I had heard was about 150 million, the representative gave us about 185 to retrofit, where it's going to take almost 200 million to take it out. Well, for, a, for the same less than 200 million, you'll have the structure there really doesn't make any sense. And so what we're talking about here is uh, um, with Third Bridge now is a brand new freeway inside of the I-5 corridor. The corridor starts at I-205 in Vancouver and I-5 and goes to I-84 and goes from where the Columbia and the Willamette come together to a little bit on the other side of I-205. And inside the I-5 trade corridor, we have two deep water ports, two transcontinental rail lines, the I-84, and I-5, which go north, south, east, and west. And we have all kinds of industrial land. And it's national freight that comes here and leaves here. We're 13th in the nation with our ports. And we have no way for our ports to get back and forth with each other and for us to support them. And there is no infrastructure that was built to support our ports. When we put those ports in 100 years ago, they didn't have any concept that we would not build a road out to mm -hmm. them or a freeway out to them, and we would use 1850 neighborhoods. So at the top of the screen, we have the... the well, put, put, the, put the map back on you, watch you see. Put the map back, and there we go. There we go, thank you. At, at the top of the screen, you'll see it goes into the port of Vancouver, connecting to I-5, giving us a brand new six lane freeway with two center lanes that would be managed for emergency vehicles and transit, and then it's bike and ped the whole way. Goes into the port of Vancouver. What that does is it provides Vancouver's port and Fruit Valley Road with direct freeway access to I-5 and removes all of the freight and hazardous material out of the downtown neighborhoods. But at, from a lay standpoint, as I look at this, give, give us some kind of a, okay. like the St. John area, you know, kind of a deal, you know. Well, <clears throat> okay, this is like this is on the west side of I-5. West side of I-5. Okay. okay. Um, on the on the north side of the Willamette River is is the is the Port of Vancouver in the downtown okay. area, and then it goes across to Jansen Beach, okay. which is that little islandy area, mm -hmm. and it goes around Smith and Bybee Lake and over to Highway 30, which okay. is how it kind of looks like a boot going to mm -hmm. the left. And then there's a tunnel right next to the train tunnels that goes into Swan Island and connects up again with I-5 and I-205. 405, excuse me. So that means that would act like a bypass. Okay. Anybody that's living out in St. John's or out in the North uh, Rivergate area wants to get out in that area or wants to even go out towards St. Helens or go north can get off and around the Rose Quarter and go out and get off about Portsmouth and Columbia Boulevard. That access is all of St. John's, Rivergate area, Northport, or whatever, as well as you can stay on it and continue going north or going to the west. So what it does is it changes how the region can work. Um, so in taking the freight traffic and designated hazardous materials out of downtown Vancouver and giving them freeway access, so now their industrial land looks more important to bring in businesses. Um, as it goes across to Jansen Beach, giving them a second bridge, we don't know if we're going to have Deepwater Harbor there. If we do, it'll support that. But we've been needing a second bridge out there. Mm -hmm. And when it goes around Smith and Bybee Lake and over to the west and goes over to, to Highway 30, that takes all the freight and hazardous material off the St. John's Bridge, Besiden, Lombard. Bypass for that. All of it. Okay. Right now, that's how the hazardous materials are removed throughout the state is by going through that neighborhood. And it helps the Lenten neighborhood too. So you have all your ports and industrial areas connected together. So now they have 21st century freeway access out to get across to the nation. And you have them out of our neighborhoods. And you make those lands that are currently landlocked by residents available. We have a thousand acres of buildable land out in the Rivergate area. We have the Fruit Valley Road is growing and the Port of Vancouver is growing all on the west side. 
So the same people who go and use the high-tech uh, lifts and things do one port, they do another port. The same people that bring them oil, the same people that service them. And so by getting all of this commerce out of the regular traffic, then it helps I-5. What they have known from doing similar studies in this area is a lot of the traffic wants to go there. By connecting our ports and industrial areas together, it drives traffic off of I-205 and off of um, I-84 and puts it back into where it needs to go where, so people are traveling less. So now you're going directly to where you work. Okay. So no, what about home displacement, things of that nature, family, um, ours has residents? Zero residents. Zero residents. Zero residents. Okay. Um, it has about a half a dozen businesses on the Oregon side that are next to North Portland Road, and most of them are youth poets. Mm -hmm. And on the Vancouver side, it would go, um, if, if they do a viaduct, which is what I think they'll have to do, they should study to see exactly how to attach to I-5. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> if they do a viaduct, they can do just like they do near uh, the, the Morrison Street Bridge, which is go right over the top because it has to be high enough up anyways for the for coming across i-5 and then again as it goes across the rails and then as it goes in, over the the columbia river so um no removal of homes and about six businesses on the oregon side zero impact on jansen beach which you'd probably like to hear mm -hmm. um and the residents there and 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 then moving over into some of the reason people are supporting the columbia river crossing with the job element mm -hmm. A, a recent article came out, you know, 300 pieces of property, 113 commercial properties with 89 businesses on it right now. And that Jansen Beach itself with the 39 businesses was going to lose over 600 jobs. Well, those are permanent jobs, 600 jobs. And then you have 500 business, 50 businesses, excuse me, on the Washington side, you know, with, with also a, 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 the other... Uh, hotel there and several other businesses. So now 1,100 is all the temporary jobs that are created from the Columbia River Crossing. And those don't even have to be local. Hmm. Well, I can tell you that somebody is washing dishes here or making beds here is probably living here locally hmm. and didn't come from out of hmm. area. And so you have perhaps more job loss. Hmm. Then you have seven years of construction on I-5. What will that do to the rest of the businesses that aren't yeah. taken on Jansen yeah. Beach or in downtown Vancouver? Yeah. What, what is cost? the job last there? What about cost now? Give me a cost as a comparison here. Uh, Ron gave me his, his comparison, 1.8 as opposed to 3.6 billion. Well, ours is three brand new freeway, three brand new bridges three and a tunnel. New. Okay. And it's about nine miles of highway and connects our ports and industrial areas together and gives us an actual bypass, similar to like how 405 is or something and um, was removed without being studied. Um, so I can tell you that the concrete value of it right. is about 3,500, uh, 3.5 million, excuse 3. me, billion. 3.5 million, okay, 3.5 billion. billion, okay. Yes, and um, that would, and you would have to decide what you're doing with your on and off ramps and things like that, but it, that would be concrete mileage of what you would have for it. Ours has the ability of not only connecting the ports and industrial areas, but their vacant publicly owned land. We can use that land mm -hmm to start building immediately. We can use it as part of our matching funds. We don't have to take up existing roads. We don't have to take up existing utilities. Now, who, who owns most of that land up in that area that you're talking about? The city of Portland and, and Metro. And Metro. And the port. Both of Smith and Bybee Lake uh, going on the... So okay. mm -hmm. let's talk about the ways these two things are similar. Right. Uh, so the Columbia River crossing expands by 23% the bridge impact area where the six interchanges are, 23% more lanes. So you've got seven lanes going south in the AM peak, and then at Delta Park, they go down to three, okay? So all that expansion is going to be look like hooking a, a fire hose up to a fire hydrant. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just not going to work as you go south, and it's going to jam up and back up onto the bridge every morning as uh, commuters come. So we're not really getting rid of the congestion there by adding, e expanding the freeway. Because mm -hmm. uh, down into the city, it's only three lanes, and it goes down to two lanes in the Rose Quarter and mm -hmm. right after the Fremont Bridge, I-5 South, goes Why down to two lanes. Why are we talking lanes. more about that? I mean, the... the well, you'd think because they're just trying to sell it, because they want to do something big. Uh, so my point is that the way these 
two alternatives are similar okay. is we're talking about getting people off I-5. Mm-hmm. And she really gets the trucks off of I-5 I and gives them their own freeway. Connection to Swan Island mm-hmm. for the trucks uh, from south and on into uh, I-5 down there, I-405. And connection over across the river to uh, Linton uh, and and on 30 uh, uh, into uh, or uh, north uh, of the city. And so, you know, the point is when they did, when they studied this connection, what they said is, wow, you know, that's a reduction of how much? A 48% uh, uh, reduction in the traffic on I-5. Mm-hmm. Uh, by building this uh, third bridge and the connection over to Linton. You have to go across the slough, too. Right, right. Uh, so, similarly, our program with commuter rail and light rail and with uh, autos and trucks going across on those two bridges, uh, that takes traffic off of I-5, too. Both uh, plans take traffic off of I-5. And so, really so they're similar in that way. It's not expanding I-5. Mm-hmm. It's taking traffic off of I-5. And we think that's a better approach. A and more, no disruption. That, well, that is, the, it's that. the only way it'll work is to take the traffic off of I-5. Okay. You can't, the I-5 freeway was deemed full in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. You can't change the fact that all of these roads come in in this short place. But what you can do is not have them all, all of them can come in, but with less people on them. <clears throat> Our project, to getting there at Mill Plain as you're coming down all the traffic that wants to go to the west is now coming off and getting off before they go across the bridge and the traffic that's coming up Highway 14 is now going north to get onto this to come over instead of going south to stop before the bridge and the same way coming back at night so it really changes people coming from St. Helens can now come in that work at Swan Island can now come in and across that Lenton into that take a freeway and take a tunnel into Swan Island and not have to use 405 and I-5 mm-hmm. and, and Yeon Street and all of that that area down there. And the businesses that want to be next to each other can be it's serving each other and it's so much quicker. This person has this next to you, this one has oil, this one has towels, this, that. they're servicing a lot less mileage. They can service a lot more and they want to be next to each other. And then they're outside of what's going on. Thousands of vehicles leave I-5 freeway and go through the neighborhoods. People tell me all the time about the little cut-throughs that they know how to use. Well, those cut-throughs are through the neighborhoods. It damages our environment, damages the economy. It's not good for the business, not good for the neighborhoods. The best thing that we can have is is I-5 so free it up that people jump on it out of the neighborhoods because that's what the freeways are for. And um, this means that they would drive less. They wouldn't have to go all the way out to 205 to get across I-5 being full. They would be going directly into the ports and industrial areas, number one, two, and three place that they're trying to get to. Commerce is trying to get there. The freight trucks are trying to get there. And the commuters, so they can unload those trucks. So, so how many uh, uh, trucks, those 18-wheelers that go across the uh, St. John Bridge, how many of them in a day? 2,718 wheelers come over the St. John's Bridge every day, with 75% of them having no destination or origin on the peninsula. 2,700. We have 26,000 vehicles that come across every day, and we have less than 12,000 men, women, and children that live there. It's a linchpin to the economy, 2% worse in the nation for air quality, and they allow traffic to use, regional traffic to use our local streets. They go from Clark County to Mount Noma County to Washington County, which is against city code. Nowhere else in town do they let the city code be violated all the time. Well, you know, the other big benefit that I'm here looking at as a lay person, I'm listening to, to both of you, is that, uh, that if one of these alternatives were, were picked or selected, then there's no disruption, if you will, on present commerce. I mean, that's, that's a big, that's a big, that's a biggie. Yeah, it's so seven adding years of construction or longer. Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean where is that traffic going to go doing that? Doing you know, that they time? haven't told us about the in-water work window yet and how, how, how many months they're going to be able to work in the Columbia to put that bridge up and to tear down the old one because of the endangered salmon runs. And so what if they can only work four months or six months out of the year in the water. Well, that's going to lengthen out that construction time. The lawsuits on the under the National Environmental Protection Act, 
you know, they say they're going to start construction in 2013. Good luck. As Sharon said, they have to acquire 300 properties. Mm -hmm. They're going to do that and all of that in 19, in 2012? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, this thing, if, if they continue to sell it and the governor doesn't show us some real leadership and ask for a reset, if the governor doesn't do that, it's just going to go on and on and on. And, you know, they're spending $2 million a month of state money. That's one point doing nine, what uh, doing their <laughs> studies and paying for their well, lobbyists and paying for their uh, their consultants and uh, d doing some design a little bit of design you know they have had to redesign the bridge and so so they're spending two million a month one million of that is from the state of Oregon mm -hmm. and so if you know every month we stretch this thing out and you got ODOT saying, well, we, we, we're not able to uh, keep that bathroom operating up at government camp uh, so people can stop on their way over the mountain. We have to uh, stop supporting that as ODOT. And, and we, ha we can't start the Newburgh-Dundee bypass. We can't start the project on widening 217. We can't start the Selwood Bridge. They're only putting $20 million of state money into the Selwood Bridge. Mm -hmm. And they spend that in uh, uh, last biennium, uh, the state of Oregon, uh, what, over $50 million last biennium. And, and that's in addition to the $80 million that Washington state spent. So, so I, I mean, you, you, you know, you got a lot. Uh, 50, 30 from Oregon, 50 from uh, Washington, total of $80 million last biennium. And, you know, and not trying to regurgitate anything again, but the thing about it, the other thing that people had some major concerns with were the beneficiaries, if you will, some of the beneficiaries mm -hmm. that were listed in terms of getting some of that money, getting that money. Conflicts of interest, I would say, you know, in some cases. It, it, yes, but the, but the big thing is, is that, that we need to stop spending the money now. It's yeah. $2 million a month. The Oversight Committee met in September. Announced meeting again in November. Between the September and the November is four million dollars gone, and since since the environmental impact statement right. has already been you know, sent off, the yeah. study's been sent off. That's all just engineering. Well, if that bridge isn't going there, and this is just engineering by the same group that that engineered something for two or three years and didn't know that it wouldn't mathematically stand it up and had major problems and had a cursory look that was able to tell them that. And do you really want them designing you another bridge? They need to stop and find out what comes back from the final environmental impact statement. But the, the big thing is the National Environmental Policy Act says we will have a range of alternatives. Everybody that's reasonable looks at five grocery stores before they buy something in a grocery right. store. They look at five stoves or they look at five refrigerators or something. And they say, well, this does this and this does this and that does that. And that's what the National Environmental Policy Act is. Go into the neighborhoods, ask them what the problem is, ask them what the need is, ask them what, and ask them what they think should be done. And anything that's reasonable is supposed to be thoroughly studied. And then they list what's thorough. And you put them up next to each other. And you say, this one does this, this does that. And you say, now we're at this point where we go, well, you know, I don't like what this is doing. Mm -hmm. So what did A do? I don't know. Well, what did C do? Well, they're going back and forth and up and down with the same project because they don't have an A, they don't have a B, they don't have a C, they don't have a D, that are listed in a range of alternatives that are thorough, were thoroughly studied, that you can say, these are all on a baseline. Mm -hmm. They didn't do a baseline. Here's one thing. Um, the common sense solution did make it a little further in the process than ours. One of the reasons that it did was they recommended that the, the a seismic upgrading be done to the current bridge. Our project didn't recommend that, that seismic. Well, if that was one of the things you were going to need in a baseline, you should have had a baseline so that when you compared everything, it was equal. Had I known that you wouldn't know to put do seismic on that other bridge, I would have wrote it in. <laughs> you know, and so the changing of the maps, the fact that the alternative was, the alternative were taken off the table without following the NEPA process by the advisory group that was under the advisory group, which was under the sponsors council. Mm -hmm. They're not the decision makers, so they haven't followed the process. Well, now tell me something, I mean, clear something up for me now. In one situation, the, the rendering that we have today, the, the photos, the, the i.e. Mm -hmm. of the proposed bridge uh, that the public, the majority of public have seen to date, that was part of that 
hundred and seventy, a hundred and some, hundred and forty million bucks, right? Well, okay. I mean, they paid for it, right? Somebody picked up the tab. What about you guys? I mean, did they uh, did they consider, if you will? I take it. I take it your alternative plans were also part and parcel of those dollars. Uh, no. No. What? No, that's just been that's, spent that's on just their it. own. They haven't. Ha no range thing. of alternatives have so, been studied so for them to pull up and they didn't, take a They look didn't at. come to you and look at your alternatives and uh, you picked up the tab. So Metro you said, hey, take a look at the common sense alternative. And to whom? To ODOT and WASHDOT and, and they the say, CRC yeah. project. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. And, and During so, the pilot process was open and they weren't allowed to do to say no. Because the process is supposed to remain open all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. and, and by them telling Metro, a signatory council, and if Metro had any husband, they would have caught up and said, who do you think you're talking to? But, hello. Um, yeah. So now we are at this problem because none of the elected officials have come out and said, excuse me, there are no clothes on this bridge. There's no whatever you want to call it. Well, Representative Smith is, is like seeing so many ways. He, well, he, he back certainly to the is. There, a range of alternatives needs to be thoroughly studied. And what needs to happen is, is people need to be calling the governor and say a range of alternatives wasn't studied and we want this process to stop right okay. now. Okay. They do okay. not need to be engineering anything because we don't know exactly what we're doing. And then they need to be contacting uh, the Oversight Committee. There's a Columbia Composed River. by whom? Uh, Representative Bentz is one of the co-chairs, Representative Tobias Reed is one of the co-chairs, and Breyer, Senator Breyer. Lee, Lee Byer. Lee Byer. B-Y-E-R. Yeah, okay. Tell you what we'll do. Let, let's open up the line right now. Maybe we might get a call that or two. That sounds wonderful. I mean, I realize this is this can, it sounds somewhat confusing. That's one of the reasons why we're spending this much time. It is a big project. It, it's a big project, and you know, hey, we're the taxpayers. we got to pick up the tab, and right in front of you, you need, you need to know what's going on about this particular project. We want the best for Oregon, the well, best for Oregon, the best for this country, for that matter, and the best for taxpayers. Well, Money is tight. Here's the one thing to think of. They Fo are put the phone number on the on the on the screen there, would you please? Uh, we'll accept your calls right now. We can make, maybe take one or two calls if we can, real quick. Like, give us a call. This project was supposed to be eighty million dollars, thirty six months, thirty percent build. It's seventy two months. It's one hundred and sixty, and we're less than ten percent build. If that isn't one of the best reasons for the same people not to be continuing with this process, I don't know what else to say. Jesus Christ. Is wow. anybody going to call? I mean, well, think about that. 100% over budget, over 100% over budget, 100% over time, none of the stakeholders are happy. You give somebody $100 million, $160 million to sell something, and they can't sell it to anybody, and the few people they can sell it to have miscommunication going on. Well, that's the nature of the deal nowadays, you know, OPM other people's money, the taxpayers, you see, other people, OPM, other people's money. Well, it's so complicated, you don't even understand what's going on. Those, those people who, uh, who are paying the freight for this, the people in this state, right. need to be outraged because mm -hmm. why are they spending all this, why did they spend and are they spending all this money on lobbyists? I'm talking about Tom yes. Mark Graff, who, who got over a million bucks. I'm talking about David Parisi, who got 1.4 million bucks. I'm talking about Patricia McCaig, uh, who's supposed to be the governor's liaison, who's still being paid by this project, which he, she, she had 230000 that was about 10 months ago. God knows what it is now. And, and so what I'm this saying is... Why should the state be paying for these lobbyists to lobby the local governments? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make uh, any sense. It's unprecedented. Uh, you can't name another project that spent that money on lobbyists. Well, where, where is our congressional delegation and our senatorial delegation? I mean, you, you mentioned They're Markraft. Not is Markraft board. still working for Earl Blumenauer? Well, Congress so there's Congress? two Congress is he still people working? Who, who are, who are uh, in whose district this goes Goes right. across. Earl One of them is Earl Blumenauer. Right. And Blumenauer says there's no community consensus on this. He has not been an advocate for it. He has not fought for it. He says there's no community consensus. Jamie Herrera Butler, Republican, Washington side right. of the river, goes, it's her district. She says, let's have a vote of the people. I'm not for this unless we have a vote of why, the people. Why, 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 why not? Why not? Uh, and and you know what? There will be a kind of a vote of the people in November tw uh, 2012, right. and they're going to have to vote for light rail in uh, in Clark County. Uh, and if they don't, then the, there won't be light rail with this project. And uh, so it's been sold as kind of a lipstick on a pig. 
the light rail. So uh, uh, Jamie Herrera Butler is saying, you know, I don't think the people are for this. I don't think the people are for this. And uh, so, so we've got the two governors and we got the legislative leadership and they all listen to the same money that comes into their campaigns from the uh, construction trades and from, uh, and from the businesses who benefit from this. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem uh, in terms of our democracy that we should have this going on now. Well, Ron, why, why can't we just say, okay, fine, with all of these various questions and, and concerns and this, that, why not stop the money? Exactly. exactly. Stop the money. And they need to contact stop the governor. Stop spending the money. And, and this, I mean, and today, the oversight stop committee. spending the money. And then let's have the discussions, if you will. Exactly. About what yeah. exactly are we going to do. Right. And, and, you know, those discussions uh, should focus on what can we afford. Exactly. What can mm -hmm. we afford? And what uh, will we get out of it? And what will we get out of it? And the results. And, and what results? And how long will it take? And th those kinds of questions need to be raised about this project, and and that w Sharon and I are calling that a reset. Right, right, and right. and so we want the legislative, the interim legislative committee, mm -hmm. to ask the governor and ask the legislative leadership and both parties in both houses for a reset. And so there's a good chance they may do that. Yes. But, when, when Representative uh, Smith was talking about the fact that he signed on a, a, a statement that he wouldn't send a letter of support, he didn't mention that 22 other elected officials, all of them House from the House, there would have been more had the Senate come and signed on, signed on that letter saying they did not want a letter of support going out for the Columbia River crossing. And since then, they've attached this note, which has the oversight committee, which talks about tolling, talks about other alternatives and all these other things attached to their budget. And the reason they did what was because ODOT had been going around them to get their funding by going through the general budget instead of going through the regular channels of the legislator and having oversight committees. So he was not alone when he said he signed that little piece of paper. He was with 22 other elected officials. And John Charles of the uh, Oregon uh, Cascade Policy said to me, it's rare you're ever going to see those people on the same list. OK. Well, look, hey, this, this has been just great. Burnett. But again, for, you, for the folks that are real quick, like for the folks who are watching the program, hey, tell your friends and look at this show. And then share it with your friends. Share it with other voters, if you will. Call the governor, et cetera. Check out the YouTube. Send that out through your computers and let the people know about this particular program. We're not, we're not going to quit. We're going to be here. We represent the people here at, at Community Cable Access, if you will. And please get the word out. we got to stop spending this money. Stop the bleeding. That's what it's all about. Stop the bleeding. Okay. Well, look, we're going to get back to you. And, and as one would say, George Page always said, back to what you believe in. But we're going to get back to the table here with these two folks. Bring them back. And let's continue to talk about this money, about this problem. It's very, very important. Have a good one.